Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Homage to him, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay. So over the years, I get lot, I get asked a lot of questions. <laughs> and um, especially, you know, here in Asia too, a lot of people will ask me, how does, uh, what is uh, questions about Buddhism, uh, whether they're Westerners or Asians, how does this become a religion? How did it ever become a religion? Uh, how did it work? And um, also the interesting thing about, since I got to India, since I got to India, um, the uh, question comes up very often from teenagers. Uh, I guess most of the time boys are asking me, but also girls are asking me um, questions about how to defend your religion when you are when you are uh, growing up and many people are coming to talk to you about their religion and why is it it's difficult to talk about Buddhism as uh, as our religion, you know? So one of my favorite writers of all time is uh, most venerable Keshri Dhammananda, Dr. Keshri Dhammananda from the Maha uh, Buddhist Vihara in, in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur. And um, this is because Bhante actually went there and he spent three years there. And I also uh, spent three different years in a range retreat period each time for like three months, for three years in a row, in a, a temple that was near there, just uh, not far away. And um, so I had an exposure to a lot of his writings. I could go over there and the bookstore had all of his writings. He was a very prolific abbot that lived uh, in, in more than 60 years, a monk. And he wrote over 88 books which is a large number of books. And the thing about the way he was writing was he was very prolific as a writer, but he was also very careful. And he was very kind in his writing. And there are certain books that people have asked me over the years, uh, if I speak to someone who's not Buddhist about our being Buddhist, what is the a really good book that they might look at to understand more about Buddhism, my favorite one, simply because we had 500 of them, and we took these books to a great big fair uh, in Missouri, and we gave them out to people all over in different communities that came to that state fair. And then afterwards, we heard from a lot of people that this book was so general about human beings that uh, you could read this book as a Christian or any other faith and really find good things and good stuff about how to help yourself. He also wrote not just the book. So that, that book, by the way, was called Living Without Fear and Worry. Living Without Fear and Worry. And online, you can find, you look up Keshu Damananda. I'll put, the, I'll put the name up here for you. And um, they have a, a they have a website. Oops, wait a minute. They have a website, and I think it's really a good thing. Kashri Damananda. He was a Mahatera monk. That means he was over 20 year monk. And he was a most venerable. That's also a title that you get. 
in, uh, through the years and he was, uh, he has, a, you go online and put this into Google, just, I think if you just put Dr. Keshri Damananda's books, Buddhist books, you probably come to a website and that website, uh, when you get there, has a list of the books that are available for free and you can get them by computer, put them on your phone, read them, however you wanna do it. Anyway, one of the things he did besides writing the books was he, he made pamphlets like these, see? And these are like small, tiny, tiny booklets, real thin booklets. And they have maybe 50 pages in them, but they're like very small pages. And there are subjects that are covered that are very uh, important. Everybody wants to think about this. Everybody wants answers about these things. Another one beyond this one is called The Purpose of Life. And he uh, wrote that one. This one that we're going to work with is called Buddhism as a Religion. Now, this uh, booklet, this little booklet has several topics in it. You see, several little tiny chapters. So each chapter is maybe two or three small paragraphs. And what I'm going to do is work our way through this book. And I'm hoping that we have enough people that show up for a discussion. We didn't get this, um, kind of got mixed up a little bit. But I had planned on having at least a week to type things out for you. I have the tonight's lesson halfway finished. It ended up halfway finished because of water arriving and other issues happening in this place where I live. It's always fun. Um, so tonight, uh, I don't have I don't have the uh, support page to give you, but I will send it. We will post it as soon as I can finish typing that probably tomorrow morning. Um, so I'm just going to start with this and you'll get the hang of it. What he's doing is he starts out with uh, some titles and tonight, if you want to write this down, uh, it's good to take notes with we're working this way with this little series. You'll have it in front of you next time. But we'll start with a definition that has to do with religion. And then the beginnings is the second title. The concept of God is the third one. The Buddha is the fourth one. The renunciation is the fifth one. And the sixth one is beliefs and practices in ancient Indian at India at the time that the Buddha arrives. And and then and the seventh one in tonight is, did the Buddha make any promise? Then next week we will go, we will continue on. Now, actually I was designing this as a three day in a row workshop or a four day in a row workshop, but we decided that we'll use it as a, a each week and we'll keep going with this series, with this topic to carry it through. It has a total of 25 little chapters and they're very short. So I'm hoping that we will have some discussion. I want you to write down questions as we go along, okay? And certainly I hope that uh, we can get a conversation going and get more people here and let people know that we're gonna do this. Okay, so let's start. The uh, little booklet is called Buddhism as religion, by Dr. K. Sri Damananda. Now, since there are already many religions in the world, um, what is really necessary for us to, why is it really necessary for us to have another religion that's called Buddhism? Is there any extraordinary characteristic or contribution or significant feature that Buddhism has, which other religions do not have? It's a good question. There is a school of thought which says that all religions are essentially the same. There are no significant differences. The only difference is in the interpretation and the practice. After all, in the final analysis, all of us end up in one place either heaven or hell. And that is the common belief of most religions. 
does Buddhism share this viewpoint? And to answer this question, we have to examine, first of all, what is meant by religion? So first we start with a definition. Now, the academic study of religion as a phenomenon in history, the term religion can be considered in its different aspects as an inner experience as a theology or intellectual formulation of a doctrine as a basis for the source of ethics and as an element in culture. Different scholars have given different views and opinions of its nature and meaning. Now, according to Aldous, Huxley, religion is among other things, a system of education of which human beings may train themselves. First to make desirable changes in their own personalities and in society, in their communities. And second, to heighten their consciousness and to establish more adequate relations between themselves and the universe of which they are part. Then the modern Indian philosophers like Dr. Radhakishan had expounded the theme that religion is not a set of doctrines, but it is an experience. And religious experience is based on the realization of the presence of the divine in mankind. H.G. Wells said that religion is central part of our education that determines our moral conduct. We can certainly connect that in Buddhism. The German philosopher Kant, he stated that religion is the recognition of our moral principles as laws that must not be transgressed. And the Buddha's message as a religious way of life, keeping away from all evil deeds, cultivation of life by doing good deeds and purification of mind from mental impurities. We know this from our teaching, don't we? And for our purposes, religion may be defined in a very broad sense as a body of moral and philosophical teachings and the acceptance and confidence of such teachings in the sense. Buddhism is a religion. Now Buddhism, however, does not neatly fit into the general categories outlined earlier because it does not share common features with other existing religions in many ways. To consider this matter further, we first have to uh, briefly examine how religion could have come into being in the first place. Now it starts to get good beginnings. What did religion, why did religion uh, originate? Now, you might have heard that the origins of religion lie in man's fear, suspicion, and insecurity in the days before organized religions began. And people did not have adequate knowledge and they could not understand the real nature of this life and what would happen to them after their deaths that became the question they could not understand even the causes of natural phenomena occurring or any natural occurrences according to their limited understanding they suspected that there must be certain unknown forces which created all of these pleasant 
or unpleasant things. And eventually, they began to notice that there is an energy behind the forces of nature, which they called Shakti. They experienced an inexplicable sense of awe and dread towards these powers, which they felt could harm them in some ways. They therefore felt that these powers must be placated and used to protect or at least to leave them alone, not trusting their own ability to talk to these forces in ordinary languages. They thought that it would be more effective to mime their messages. And finally, actions to enlist the favor of these forces became ritualized into forces of war, forms, various forms of uh, worship. So some people were identified as having special powers to communicate with these forces, and they enjoyed great powers in the group that was setting up this group, this type of ritualization. And after worshiping and praying, early men thought that they could control the undesirable occurrences and at the same time ensure a degree of protection as a reward from these unseen forces or energies. And to help them better visualize what they were trying to communicate with, they gave each force a name or a form and either conceived it in human form or in some grotesque non-human form, but always evoking a sense of awe and fear. And as time went by, they forgot the original significance of these representations and took them for real and eventually accepted them as actual deities. So you see this development how it worked. Different cultures translated ideas and concepts into physical form and developed particular rituals to honor and worship these images as gods. And later in early urban settlements, they began to, and social control became necessary and certain practices were used as the basis to develop moral behavior and to guide the citizens in the correct path to ensure the well being of the entire community. Thus, developed concepts such as humanism, human responsibilities, human values such as honesty, kindness, compassion, patience, tolerance devotion, unity, and harmony. These things were to ensure that these qualities would be further enhanced and the leaders instilled fear into the believers, threatening them with punishment by the gods in the life hereafter if they did not behave in an accepted manner in the community. Religion was the result of the fusion of moral behavior and belief in the supernatural. So we'll discuss morality in greater detail a little bit later, it comes up a little bit later in its own chapter. Now the concept of God is important to understand here. Now, this is how imagination and humanism eventually fused together to become religion. And some people say that it is difficult to believe that any God created religion. Perhaps we could say that man created religion and later introduced the concept of God into religion. An American philosopher, Professor Paul Whitehead, he once stated that originally man created God and later God created man. What he meant was that the concept of God was created by man and later this concept was transformed into divinity. 
On the other hand, a French philosopher, Anatole France, he said that if the concept of God did not exist, somehow or other, man would have created one because it's very important for his psyche. A divine power is necessary to allay or calm the innate fear and suspicion, worries, disturbances, and anxiety and craving to avoid problems we depend on an external force to give us a solace. And knowing the nature of the human mind, therefore Anatolic France said that if a God did not exist, we would have to create one. In this sense, we are just like children. For when the baby is crying and the mother is too busy to carry it, what she does is to put a teat in its mouth to comfort it. And that will stop the baby from crying. The concept of God helps many people in this manner to stop their worries and dry their tears. And they develop various pacifiers in the form of religious beliefs and practices. And now I talk about the Buddha and what happens with this. One thing I wanted to mention when studying this before, there was a big discussion about this and um, the word religion, and he talks about this, Keshu Namanada talked about this in a different talk, religio has to do with a monotheistic God being there to take care of you. And so the God is taking care of us and we are not as responsible for our life as maybe we could be in working things through. Now that was the it, Italian, the word religio in the Latin, okay? But there was in our discussion group, there was a Greek philosopher, a master of Greek language. And he said, I can't remember the word for you, but there was a word that they used. The Greeks had a different angle for religion. So you're talking the Spartans, you know, and the, uh, the groups that were the fighting Greeks. And their idea of religion was interesting comes a little bit maybe closer to uh, where the, the Buddhism is because their idea of religion, the word they had meant something that is in the training of the human being as they're growing up that makes them whole. Now this gets more interesting because in the medical field, in the mental uh, disorders and such, in order to go out and attempt to go back in the mainstream the, the, the psychologist or the psychiatrist is looking for something. They're looking for the complete human being. Are they strong enough to go back into the mainstream? And when you go, uh, when I was in um, the support work I was doing in mental health, there's three points they're looking for. A healthy body and knowledge of what happened and a healthy mind, a stronger mind, but also a healthy spiritual pursuit or spiritual path being pursued for the balance of the spiritual part of the human being. And this was the angle that the Greeks were looking at. And I found that kind of interesting. It was different than just right there in Italy when you look at the two countries. So their idea was wholeness comes from the mind, the body and the spiritual balance. The Buddha, here we go with the Buddha, it was in a religious climate such as this that we've described that the Buddha appeared. And as a prince living in the lap of luxury, he started to think very deeply on why living beings suffer in this world. What is the cause of this suffering? He asked himself. And one day while he was sitting under a tree, as a young boy, he saw a snake suddenly appear and catch a frog. And as the snake and the frog were struggling, an eagle swooped down from the sky and took away the snake with the frog still in its mouth. And that incident was a turning point for the young prince to renounce the worldly life. He began to think about how 
living beings on earth and in the water survive by preying on each other. One life form tries to grab and the other tries to escape. This eternal battle will continue as long as the world exists. And this never ending process of hunting and self-preservation is the basis of our unhappiness. It is the source of all our suffering. And the prince decided that he would discover the means to end this suffering. This is the quest he goes on. And you have to feel the compassion that he had for seeing what he saw when he went outside the temple and he saw basically someone who was old and with old age and someone who was sick and then someone who had died. And then he saw a monk sitting under a tree, content, smiling in meditation. The renunciation is what happens next. He's, he studied under various religious teachers when he began his quest and learned everything that he had to teach, but was unable to discover how to end suffering. He spent many years pondering the question. Finally, at the age of 29, he seriously contemplated old age. He reflected upon it and reflected upon sickness and death and freedom through renunciation, decided that without giving up his worldly preoccupations, his responsibilities and pleasures, it would be impossible for him to find the answer. And that is why he had to leave the palace in what is known as the great renunciation. And after struggling for six years, which represented the culmination of endless life cycles of cultivation and struggle for spiritual development, he finally gained enlightenment and understood the secret of our suffering. And this was the beginning of another religious system, but it was a religion like nothing anyone had known in the past. In fact, many people today do not even like to call Buddhism a religion because the word religion evokes a great many negative emotions in their mind. We next, the next part is beliefs and practices that are in ancient India at the time. So there was no reason at all for the Buddha to introduce another religion because at that time, 2,600 years ago, there were already 62 religious cults in India alone. And since the existing religions during his time could not provide the answers to his questions, he decided not to use the ingredients or the concepts of these religions to introduce what he himself had realized. Now we know if you've been around us fairly long, that's not totally true. <laughs> A lot of those groups discussing their points of view and what they believed had elements that had to be examined by him and had to come together in a particular way. So it's not like he rejected everything. But what was the religious thinking in India at that time is important to understand. God created everybody. God is responsible for everything. God will reward. God can forgive all our sins. God is responsible for our lives. After our death, God will send us to heaven or he will send us to hell. And these are the basic ingredients of all the religions even today. And at the same time, there were certain other religions also in India, which taught that it was necessary for believers to torture their physical bodies thinking that they could wash away all their sins 
during their lifetimes so they could go to heaven after death. And another religious group encouraged religious rites and rituals and ceremonies and animal sacrifices to please the gods. And this group believed that through these practices, they could go to heaven. And some others, again, introduced prayer and worship and asked forgiveness for sins committed. And the Buddha did not recognize the efficacy or the legitimacy of all of these practices. He came outside and started something else. Did the Buddha make any promises? And this is an important part to ask. The Buddha did not promise heavenly bliss, rewards to those who called themselves his followers, nor did he promise salvation to those who had faith in him. To him, religion was not a bargain, but it was a noble way of life to gain enlightenment and salvation. The Buddha did not want followers with blind faith. He wanted human beings to think and understand. Buddhism is a noble path for living where humanism, equality and justice and peace reign supreme. Revengefulness and animosity, condemnation and resentment are alien in the teaching. It's interesting because Buddhists do not proselytize. That means I would be teaching you something with my objective to make you become a Buddhist. Actually, the Sangha is supposed to be promulgating Promulgation means to research and practice and preserve and teach the original teaching, to preserve it in a way it can still be taught and the conclusion, the results can still happen. And this is the basis for Suttavada to go back to the text. The Suttavada is what uh, we say our tradition is now. So we rely on the early sources of the text and our whole cycle of teaching when we are working with you is we are attempting to show you what we found has worked the smoothest for the meditator to give them the most support for a, meditate that, a meditation that operates. So it's all about operation. There is no asking you to become a Buddhist. You know, I've been a nun, this interesting thing. I've been a nun since 2006 and only this past year in beer, when I was up there, one of the students and her son came to me and he, he actually said, my mother wants to become a Buddhist. So I had to take one of the monks to help me. And we went into the temple that was on the Premises of that retreat and sat her down and went through teaching her the basics and ushering her in as a Buddhist. So it's been what? It has been since 2006. I've never had anyone ask me to help them become a Buddhist. It was really fun to do this with the monk. It was really fun. We shared the different chants and taught her the basic prayers and the basic service. And she uh, actually lives in Corsica, in the Mediterranean, the island of Corsica. But you would think if I'm here, almost like in a missionary capacity sort of people, but we don't say missionaries, we're just here to teach. And we wanted to have the teaching Bhante found, the teaching he was teaching to take a root again even if it's a small root in India where this happened, to have a root there. We thought it's important to teach people in the United States. The United States is just like what the Buddha walked into. There's 
in, in 2006, there was uh, something like 32 different types of Buddhism functioning there. And, and there was a lot of confusion as to what was really happening in the beginning when we started looking around, you know? And the chance of it really staying pure is not as good as if we could have a place here where we could be teaching this as a uh, something pure from the early text and having people try it the only way to convince a person is to have them try it and see enough of it working that you all of a sudden go wow <laughs> wow this is real i can still remember going to his cootie knocking on the door when i reached a particular level and said to him I can't believe this, but you know, I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> and at that point, it had been about a year and a half. And I said, this is really real. And I stood on one side of the screen door saying that to him. And he was just smiling. Yeah, I told you so. <laughs> but he never, ever, ever pressed me to leave anything else I had behind, you know. And one of the important things to remember the Dalai Lama said about this is he made a statement once, a wonderful talk he gave. And he said, you know, everybody should be exposed to Buddhism, he said. And he was very quiet. And then he said, what I mean is, everybody should investigate it far enough to figure out if you understand it, it will make you a better whatever you are. So he was not proselytizing. He was telling them, you can be a better Jew, a better Christian, a better Muslim, a better anything you are, if you were to look at this. And that's what I want you all to discover from this series when we go through this whole thing, because it was just really wonderful the way he did this in this pamphlet. So let's keep going. Okay. Did the Buddha make any kind of promise? Well, he didn't. I already said that, right? Okay. I'll do it. The Buddha did not promise heavenly bliss, rewards to those who called themselves his followers, nor did he promise salvation to those who had faith in him. However, we do have transcendence. We do transcend something, you see? And uh, there is transcendental dependent origination. And there is something that changes in us through this practice. To him, religion was not a bargain, but a noble way of life to gain awakening and salvation. Again, the salvation has a little bit of a different type of, of uh, definition to those who had faith in him. And to him, religion was not a bargain or a noble way of life to gain an awakening. The Buddha did not want his followers to come with blind faith or human beings he wanted human beings who would think and understand and follow instructions, follow instructions, okay? And he wanted uh, to um, have a noble path for living where humanism, equality, justice, and peace reign supreme. And revengefulness, animosity, and condemnation and resentment were alien to the teaching outside of it. The world is indebted to the Buddha for the rise of rationalism as a protest against the superstitions of religion. This is what happened in India with Baba Sahib uh, Ambikar. This is what happened because of the statement he could bring justice and peace and um, equality and this kind of thing without any of the animosity or condemnation. It's one of the things that happened. And it is he who emancipated man from the thraldom of the priests. It is he who first showed the way to free man from the coils of hypocrisy and religious dictatorship. And during the Buddhist time, no religious practice was considered higher than the rites and rituals and sacrifice of living beings to the gods, but to the Buddha, no practice could be more humiliating or degrading to mankind. A sacrifice is nothing more than a bribery and salvation 
one by bribery and corruption is not a salvation which any self-respecting man or woman would care to get. Religious terminology, I keep going a little bit further. Yeah, we're a little bit further. But in introducing his doctrine, the Buddha did not use existing religious terms current in India at the time, because in this way, he would be on familiar ground with his listeners. He changed some words. You've heard us talk about the word samadhi, yeah? And you've heard uh, some of the things we found about it with Rice Davies saying his suspicion, strong suspicion, was that the word samadhi was not needed to be invented to mean the word concentration because a kagata was being used at the time. And yet, comes down to us now that way. But the word can be broken up and mean something else having to do with serenity and insight. They would grasp what he was alluding to and then he could proceed to develop his original ideas from a common ground with people. He never picked a fight. I love to read you the suttas, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not as good as the Buddha was at figuring out how to answer you sometimes. He never told people uh, this art, as you read the suttas, you begin to hear it's, it's an art, it's a gift that he had of uh, not confronting you and arguing with you. He never did that. He listened to what you say when he comes to you, he listens very closely to what your problem is and then what you think it means. Then he gives you a simile or he explains it again in a very simple way to show you what the dark side is and then shows you the converse light side. And then he asks you the question about the dark side and about the light side. And you come out wanting the light side. And by the end of the lesson, you made the decision, I want to go. And this is what happened to, um, you know, Madeline when she wanted to be uh, a Buddhist. She, she could taste that enough. She had gone far enough to really see that he was doing it that way. Not feeling pushed at all by any kind of very tight uh, dogma locked around her at all in her development. That was what was different. So these words we're using now are dharma or dhamma, okay? Karma or kama. And the, the either or is the, Pali is the kama and the, the karma is the, um, right? Can't get it. <laughs> um, the other language. <laughs> the, the Sanskrit. Thank you, Sanskrit. Sanskrit. That's Sanskrit, the karma is the Sanskrit. The Dharma is Dhamma in, in, the, in the Buddhist version. Nirvana is the Sanskrit. Nibbana is the Pali. The Muksha is the opening. Uh, it's the liberation of mind, liberation of mind. Um, and then Niraya and Samsara and the Atma. The Atma is uh, the Gemos, the Atma in much of the religion here was to get to be one with God and the self to turn into a, a locked into the God. Okay. But here is to be being different and he'll get into that later. There are some of the words that were common to all the religious groups during the time, but in his teachings, the Buddha gave very rational and unique meanings and interpretations to these existing terms okay so next time we're going to dive in to cover the dharma and the karma and the nibbana and then we will go into the development of mind and the buddha's method and then we'll go the following to the next meeting okay so i'm going to turn this over to you and, and ask you if you have questions um, 
and shoot questions because what comes to me here when I'm in India, people don't understand how to talk about um, Buddhism in a way that lets people see that there is a beautiful transcendence that takes place in a person that they transcend. So when you think to yourself, do you understand what transcending something means, letting it go and replacing it? And this is what right effort is doing. This is what your six R's is doing. Your six R's is looking at the unwholesome and then releasing the unwholesome and relaxing the mind. And then it's bringing up a wholesome to replace it and smiling and keeping going with whatever your task is in life. And this is an all the time practice. This is not such a big difference from other practices, except for one thing. You can do it all the time in every interaction with every human being throughout the whole day. So what's so important about that? Neuroplasticity. <laughs> Neuroplasticity is what's so important. And all of the research in neuroplasticity, which is the flexibility of the brain, the flexibility of the neural pathways in your brain. And each neural pathway, I can't, I should do a drawing on my head. Uh, the one picture, I don't remember where I have it, but it's a picture of a skull and they did it with fluorescent colors. And they had the picture of the skull and all these little, little things sticking out of the top of the skull are like threads. And there's one thick one. And this man had a problem with anger management. And then these new MRI cameras got a picture of these pathways. You could actually see these pathways and see that they could change and taking pictures of them here and then doing something for three or four months and then seeing it change was very exciting and shocked the world. And I think this is going to go to a Nobel Prize. And I wish with all my heart and soul the mindfulness movement that has been established would just be quiet for a moment and open their ears the rest of the way to see what the potential is with all of this. Because it didn't happen that this person got over his anger by concentrating hard on something and just paying attention to the anger. It was a system that made him to replace what happened and he was doing before with a new pattern of behavior. It's a thrilling thing. It's so magnificent. I can't believe people are not out there just writing like crazy about it. Because in the mental health community, people are so downtrodden. You think somebody in your family has a, a depression, okay? That's just the beginning, isn't it? Depression, dis depressive disorders is only the beginning. That's just this piece. And the next piece comes from the frustration of all the relatives around you because you don't behave the way they want you to. So you take drugs to calm down. And then you get depressed because you can't feel anything. And then the next step is you don't want to go out around people anymore. And you're afraid of people. And then you want to stay home and you become agoraphobic. But in between that part, if anybody comes to visit you or there's a family function and they want you to go to it, you might walk into that family function with people around you and then have a panic attack and you're soaking wet and you run away and hide in your room. See, this just all started with a depression and not understanding how this depression operates. And I can't understand why this is not in high school health class, because this is something I can teach a taxi driver. I can teach a truck driver. I can teach a laborer who is not even an educated person. You see? So why the world is not grabbing onto it when they'll wake up? But it feels, now I don't know if it's true, but it feels frustrating to hear that to have a mindfulness course to help myself, I need $800 to do that for eight weeks. And I'm only gonna see a coach for one day, for an hour or two, for one Friday evening. And I'm not gonna see them any except for that. When I had a teacher who I could see every day and talk to 
in a retreat for 10 days to learn something. And then I was kind of lucky <laughs> because I'm driving him all over the country and all over the world. I'm working as his manager person or support person. I'm able to ask him questions all the time. But let me explain something. The phone is waiting for you to contact me. You can call me anytime you want, but it isn't calling me so much as emailing me. You will get a reply. You know, I structurally set up the first group online. There were 800 people in that original group from 28 countries coming in like crazy asking questions. But you have to have a teacher in the room all the time. This is what happened recently, the room is empty. <laughs> and somebody said, why is it so quiet? I said, well, say something, <laughs> you know, say something. And something might happen because the room that's there now is active. But since I went overseas and started working, there's not a dedicated teacher. And to be, so you understand what happened, they were my stimulation to learn as much as I possibly could to help you when that group was hot and heavy and working a lot. Because when they asked a question, I had to go to Vanti and get the answer and come back and give them the answer. And I had to learn the answers to everything. And then after a couple of years of him checking everything, then I was cut free. And at that point, I would go to him for, con uh, you know, confidentially, you know, advise me on this or that if there was something strange that happened. But basically, I had the answers. Yeah. People need to use us. We want you to use us. I don't want, uh, I don't really, I think if we could, I know there's a language barrier, but we have solutions. We have people that will help us. You can even, I'll tell you, I, I should dare Perel to do this, for instance, just write me a letter and give me a question, but go ahead and write it in Hindi and send it over. And probably if I take it to Traduka or I go, I like Traduka translation, Traduka. Okay, but Google, I can probably figure out what it is and I can write you back and I can actually flip it into Hindi and send it back to you and see what happens. It's like wake up time, you know? And when I say that, it's because when I got to be 70, <laughs> when I got to be 70, I realized, hey, it's wake up time. Please call us, use us, ask us. Sarah's good at asking. Oh, uh, yeah. And you is good at call. Many of you here are very good. But keep asking questions. When you think of something, oh, yes, I see Sarah. Go for it. It's not so much a question, but um, an observation from something mm -hmm. you, you just said about why isn't this taught more in schools? And or why isn't it taught at all in schools? And it just reminded me of um, one of the letters. I get regular letters from my daughter's school. And uh, one of the last ones said, well, we've done the compassion now during COVID and we've given you all a break and now it's time for excellence again. <laughs> like it's going to be there instantly. When, well, the world, it, when the world has just decided that we need masks for almost forever. And, you know, maybe they're letting the kids go back to school, but still, still what seems obvious to me is everybody really doesn't know what they're doing and that's to be expected though nobody should be yelling or putting down anybody in this whole situation like putting down trump for instance and now saying he did everything wrong in the beginning nobody was there but the beginning but them let's point this out for just a minute whether it was right or whether it was wrong he was the first world leader to stop flying people into the country he was the first one to shut down the air airlines and stuff. But I'm not defending him. What I'm saying is this was a pandemic that was truly a pandemic and is a pandemic. I, I struggle with what it is. I think it's basically a flu. I know a lot of people here, they got sick and they got better. I know that they're advertising the, the, uh, the get well uh, figures in the United States. When you get sick, like not something like in the 90 percentile range are getting better and eventually going home. They're surviving, okay? It wasn't that um, it's, it's not a flu. It, it was that it happened for the first time in human history all over in all the countries at the same time, which is that's the overwhelming factor. There just aren't enough beds. 
And you know, there aren't enough nurses, there aren't enough doctors, there's not enough of stuff. That was what was so horrendous here. But to expect the kids to flip and give you excellence sounds like a bunch of parents putting pressure on the kids. What happened, Sarah? Tell me, tell me. Well, I don't know what happened, but I, I just felt it was really missing the point because it was assuming that compassion means you wouldn't have expectations or um, teachings of excellence. I don't see the two are mutually incompatible. So it's very binary. And I, what I pick up from some of the things they, they, they write is, is a very binary feeling like we'll do compassion now because it's a difficult time. But they, I think they also use the words like, we need you all to come back with um, a can-do mindset, ready for excellence. And, and for me, the compassion needs to run through the whole of education. It's, it's, not a, um, <laughs> it's not something you switch on and switch off. And the exactly. excellence. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with you. I'm, I'm having trouble. I'm just what crossed my mind just now was Bonte's definition of compassion. You ready? Seeing a person in pain, understanding their pain is their pain and I can't take it away. And number three, allowing them the space to have their pain and loving them unconditionally. Okay, that's the, the four points for the definition for compassion. So I, I saw that you were in pain. There was COVID all around you. So I know that I can't take your pain of experiencing this away, but I can give you the space to have your pain. So what I'm going to do is lock you in your villa for six months and you can't come out and walk outside at all. That was my experience. You know, my, our experience, Bonte's and mine was very strange. We flew into that airport in Goa, you know, after the retreat up in, in Rear, when we arrived in that airport, we, uh, let me explain how it happened. There was an international flight that took a local flight because the local plane had already been put away in the barn. So this international flight picked us up from Delhi and took us to Goa. And when we arrived on an international flight, there were a bunch of Germans and other people and they wanted them to go straight to the hospital. There were just nurses and doctors receiving us as we came off the plane. And they would take your temperature and then they would question you and you had a small form you filled out. And you know, there was nothing wrong with us, but they took us and they put us when they, they put us on the chairs to do last. When everybody else left, they came over and stood in front of us. And we're sitting there innocently trying to figure out what's going on. We just want to get to a cab and go to where we have the villa is there, the two-story villa thing for us to stay in that the student gave us. We just want to go there and stay and stay inside. And they came and told us we had to go to the hospital. And I started laughing. I said, why do we have to go to a hospital? And they looked at each other like this. They went like this. And they, she looked at the other doctor and she looked at me and she said, you don't seem to understand. You have a condition. <laughs> and I, I, I said, do tell, please. What is the condition I have? I've been you know, quarantined in retreats for three and a half months not going anywhere but in one spot and i'm perfectly healthy so tell me what my condition is are you ready you're old that's all she said you're old because we were both over 70 so they wanted to take us to a hospital and i said i'm sorry we're not going to a hospital we're perfectly healthy if you want to quarantine us in the place you put us to we're happy to go in and not come out i won't even come out of the door i swear to you I will disinfect everything when I walk inside and we'll stay inside. People will bring us food. You know, we, we had people bringing us food from all around. But the point is, it's it, nobody knew how to handle the whole thing. The next day they showed up and took our temperature and this was comical, they stamped my hand. I love this part. They came in and they stamped my hand like this with a thing like you went to the fair and I'll stamp that you came in the gate one of those stamps on your hand. And on it was the doctor's name and the phone number. I didn't know what she was doing. She just keep this on your hand, she said. If you need help, give us a call. Well, I took a shower. 
and the phone number and the name of the doctor was gone. What we do is, but what you're, what you're talking about, these kids, there was nothing compassionate about putting them in their house and locking them up and saying they couldn't go out anywhere. I don't know if you saw online, there was a thing that went viral when the mother told her daughter after so many months she was going back to school, the little girl started shaking and just broke down crying in her mother's arms. She was 13 years old. All she wanted in her life was to be in school. 13, come on, first boyfriend, first love, didn't get a chance to say hello across the room. Who knows what's going on there, but she wanted to be in school and she had been sent home basically locked up, yeah. And uh, this has been no picnic, you know? And then the dangerous thing that uh, Dr. Barat and I talk about is how people don't take the, the masks seriously. You know, and if I go over to the temple, I don't go over there. Why don't I go over there? Because if I go over there for a service with 50 people sitting in the room, two people have masks on. No one is wearing masks. And then our, our numbers go up and down. It's a new way of breathing. High numbers and low numbers. High, you can feel Ulasnagar breathing like this and Mumbai like that too. And the problem for Mumbai is as soon as you fix your trains and you tell everybody they can go to work by train, what do they bring home? And then the numbers jump up to really high numbers again. It's a sad thing that they thought what they did was compassionate at all. They turned these kids off in their prime. When you, when you saw that little girl, you just, it grabbed your gut, you know, to see this child just, just letting go of the pressure, and like the, the, the bug was taken off the top of her and just melting into her mother's arms. And the mom sort of thought it was cute. She filmed the whole thing. I don't know if she really thought it was going to be that serious. At the end, she took her away and turned off the camera. But you know, the suicide rates, nobody's talking about this. The suicide rates for the elders and the suicide rates for the teenagers, I started fishing around, are just going through the ceiling. Nobody's talking about what's happened here yet. How long it will be before we really understand what has happened, yeah? And the thing about this is that um, the, um, about the teaching, Sarah, is that human beings have something in their DNA. I can't figure this out. I wish somebody with microbiology would jump in and tell me what it is. But the problem is that in the human beings have two things in their DNA. Number one, they have to belong to group. They have to belong to a group. They have to have a label on them. See, that's why I'm saying I'd like to teach this, but I'd rather teach it as a humanistic institute, which is where this was supposed to be going instead of Buddhist, you see? Yeah. Why does it have to be Buddhist? He never said that. There weren't any Buddhists until he left, until he died. Then all of a sudden there were Buddhists. During the time he was alive, they were following a, philosoph a philosoph philosophical teacher with a certain set of point of views and a practice that was helpful for people. But not until he dies does this become a Buddhist thing, see? And this group thing is very destructive. And I've never realized in the piece work I did and stuff before, I never caught how serious this is that, that we have to belong inside a label in a box. That's the first thing. Okay, the, the second part of it, I probably forgot it by now. <laughs> and I probably forgot it a second ago. Uh, but the second piece is this, this here, this thing. See this right here. Actually, most of the world believes that, um, you know, that this is not here. You know, this, this head. <laughs> how do I do this? I don't know how to do it. You know, um, okay, here you go. This head in this picture, this is me, I'm talking to you, but I don't have a head. This is the world you live in. We have, we live in modern times and we like to say that we're very smart, but here we sit and we still have one of the biggest taboos that is still totally in place, stronger than the taboo, taboo was with discussing that your sister has cancer. 
it's it's still it's it's a huge big forceful taboo we don't talk about anything that's wrong with anybody's head if we can help it we don't want anybody to know there's anything different but the funny part about this whole thing is when you really start asking people what is normal <laughs> That's a huge, flexible topic, isn't it? How do we describe to a child, mom, what is normal? <laughs> and you know, even if you've been to school as a psychiatrist, you must have thought about it while you went through school. What is this? How can we say what is normal psychiatrically, the normal thing for the mind, the brain? See? And so, um, it's, it's a difficult thing to get something into school to discuss it in health class. And yet you're perfectly happy discussing everything for the male and female about puberty and every other organ in the entire body, but you don't wanna talk about the symptoms for, um, for bipolar disorder. They should be in there by now, shouldn't they? But I don't do it anymore. I used to go to high schools and get that book for 11th and 12th grade and really see what's in it. I should try it here and see what's in it. I think I have two students, one's 11, uh, level 11, the other's 11, level 10, and ask them what is in this book that is telling you about the human body? Because you know what? This is part of my body. And we're still in denial of it and we live in 2021. So, the pain of this has been extraordinary. And every week I hear from people that are really suffering from it, the, the lockups. And I, you know, they, I hear some stories get written about, but they're not the ones I'm talking about, the ones not I survived, but the ones that really tell us what happened, yeah? Yeah, so I'd love for the for the for the school to. I, if I was a parent, I would stop for a moment and ask them, "What was it that was compassionate about turning off school when you're a preteen or a teenager? Did your daughter talk to you about this?" Well, my my daughter had a very different experience because she had online school, and she's very balanced and she really liked it. And she and her friends were able to chat online during their lessons together in pajamas. And um, <laughs> it was a, I would say for her, but this, I, I, I completely understand this is not um, a universal experience. This is, this is partly the character she is and the balance that she has around her, her studies. But um, the aspect that I felt was very positive for her, and it, it, it reflects back to some of the conversation we've had around, around actually Buddhism as religion and the path of self-inquiry and self-responsibility rather than looking to an external protector. I felt that this period, she accelerated in her personal inquiry and independence around her studies. Now she's just 15. And it felt like she was moving forward in a way that you might expect study to be at university. That's so there was really much, much more um, uh, self-motivation coming through. And sometimes things like there's a recorded lesson there I'm not going to do it now because I'm going to have a long lunch and I'm going to do it later. So making decisions. Yeah, making a decision and being well being, But That's actually still doing the studying. So, and that is, that is what I, um, so that's a positive. And one, one of the things I think you might find interesting, so I've done over the years now, uh, quite a bit of teaching in schools, but generally a much younger level. And I, after a while, I, I asked them questions like, Who, who's in charge of you? And they, they do something hilarious. I mean, it's, it's sad, but it's quite funny. They kind of screw their faces up and they look around. <laughs> <laughs> um, my mum, 
<laughs> think again, my dad, uh, the head teacher, um, you, they literally, year group after year group, okay. have no idea that there is a sense of themselves to take yeah. charge. So I introduce this to them and say, but who, who might go far first, you know, when, when, when there's something going on and the friendships, are, your friendships in, in trouble and do you always need to wait for your mum, your dad, a teacher? Who, who else might there be who could sort it out? Ah, uh, <laughs> little faces go, hmm. And then some, sometimes a little voice pipes up and goes, oh, oh, me? Mm -hmm. The schools are not teaching them. And so they, they, they are indoctrinated with hierarchy and somebody else, a bit like the conversation we've been having about a protector, someone else needs to take charge and make the decisions. And none of it is down to them. Well, so, world, yeah, worldwide right now, I think even if they're not a socialistic country, there is a push towards dependence on the states. Uh, and now kind of that's what, when you look all over the world, you don't find, it's not easy to find a country uh, where people are independently uh, feeling that they are powerful. I mean, what's happening to you is not unusual. In the United States, a, if you're a teenager, you're a victim. Mm. And the problem is the perpetuation of this in the psychological community. I mean, with the psychiatrist, it's mixed up. You, you have to figure out where you get one that works well with you. And to me, to me, this is just, um, uh, you know, step by step is the best way. And I think 12 steps work for some people, but they don't work for everybody. And this thing of going back, 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 when you're trying to be learning to stay in the present time and move forward like this can be very detrimental. And what happened to a relationship in my family, one of the sorest relationships happened from the years in college when my daughter was going for uh, psychological help and I had no access to knowing what was happening at all by law. I couldn't do anything to find out anything about her once she hit 18, but I was you know, paying for college, our families were coming together, members of the family to pay for college, but we had no rights at all to know what was happening for her. And I had to, I call it Shanghai, you know, the trick, trick the psychologist into saying yes and no answers to my own prescription of figuring out, did she come to, does she come to her, uh, you know, meetings? Do you think she's making progress type stuff? But the thing I found out afterwards from her attitudes, her communication abilities, her knowledge of what was she was going through and everything else was they, they backed her up 100%. She felt that she was a victim. It wasn't based on anything. It's a very scary thing, actually, what happened. And, and I think I may have mentioned to someone later, I met several women the same their kids were born the same year, they were female, they went to college, the same thing happened in the United States. So in the psychological unit in the universities, I'm suspicious this gets supported more than we know. If you feel you're a victim, oh yes, you're a victim. Oh, it's not your fault, you're not responsible. And I remember a terrifying time once when I was traveling with Bonte, uh, we I got into a hotel room and I used to, if I was tired, I would flip on the TV to watch the advertisements, this is funny, to try to determine what the population was thinking and doing in that area of the country when I was moving all around the states. And this was at the time of the tsunami uh, and uh, the Clinton and Bush, the two past presidents got on sitting on two stools, I'll never forget it. And the statement Clinton looked right at us and said, please give your money to us, don't send it to anything else to send for the tsunami help, send it directly to us, we'll take care of you. And it was the first time I had ever heard a politician in my life say, uh, just let us take care of you completely. And I remember I felt a chill run through me. Where did this come from? That we can't decide for ourselves how we want to help in this situation. You see, it sounds funny, but it turned out to be true. <laughs>
<laughs> you know, very scary. But when you look at the countries, the way they operate now, you know, we don't have a real democracy anymore. We have representative democracies, but we don't have an actual a kind of pure form of democracy anymore. So people are looking to get taken care of, taken care of. And then we nearly collapsed our country with the welfare system the way it was designed. Because if you got to a point where you were letting them take care of you, you could get trapped. And I met families uh, that uh, were trapped for like generations in that system. It's a very scary system. Someday ask me, I don't want to talk about it now, but they had a, a level where if you went, tried to get a job and went above it, you would lose your, you'd lose your support. And then to get back your support again, would have to wait a year to get it. And you could, you could die, you could starve. You could fall out, you know, if you weren't strong enough to keep working here, there wasn't enough time between this and you making money and so they kept failing and failing and failing and then picking it up again and finally just sitting in it and not wanting to try to get out of it at all. But it, the system was designed to oppress and control. It was a very sad system, yeah. So this thing is um, the powerlessness is something that we can discover with Buddhism to learn the dependent origination to see how that works, to make it a game. You should make it a board game with her. Make her a board game. I did this with um, a student once from another country. I, we set up a board game, but I never produced the game. But you have a circle, you know, and you have to go around a board. And when something happens and you're caught, you have to figure out, you have to throw uh, the, turn the spin the wheel to get enough steps to go through the links you have to go through to get to the end. See, it's like a board game. And our definitions are simple. They're nothing to do with Buddhism. It's just how your head works. You know, you should play with the chart with her. Just, you know, the what comes to mind is the woman in North Carolina who had the depression. She didn't know that it wasn't her total complete fault and it was it was um the way it was operating she didn't know she had any power she thought everything was you hear me say this all the time is life actually happening to you or are you beginning to understand that you have a choice and it's happening from you and you put up a white a blank picture in her room or put it in the bathroom or put it in the hallway somewhere she sees it every day. It's a white canvas and she gets to paint the canvas every single day. And every night that canvas disappears and it's white again in the morning and you get to color it each day of your life. That's pretty powerful. When you thought I was, everything was just, you know, out of control and you had no control over anything, but you really do. And then another thing, we had a woman who, she had gone through some really bad times. And uh, when we realized, uh, Bhante, and he realized that the po point was to get her in the present time and to teach her there was power in the present time. The most powerful, efficient mind and potential for the brain is right here in the present time. Not back here in the past, not over here in the future, right here. So if you can get in that car and you can start to move and see what your life is like, that's like a game to see that. That's a marvelous thing, but she couldn't do it. She had been, uh, uh, had some bad traumas and was just afraid. So the way to get out of the afraid, she wanted to try. Her friends were having a meeting in Northern California. She wanted to drive the car and join them and stay there for the, for the affair. And, and, you know, it was sort of like uh, girls from college getting together again. But she was afraid to go by herself. So we bought her a bracelet and she had to make the bracelet and the bracelet had these little beads, you know, around it, the beads. And there was a bead, uh, a blue one for the past and there was a pink one for the future. And there was this uh, crystal one, crystal, really beautiful crystal bead that was in the center. She made it, she put it on her arm and she kept touching it. 
to remember. She kept touching it. And anytime she had a feeling about the past or a fear about the future, she would hold on to the crystal. And she pulled herself and she got in the car and she drove up there and she had this weekend. And she came back and we were thrilled. This was like a breaking out. I can do this. How? By the strength and the power of understanding the potential of the mind in the present time. Yeah. And she did it. So you got to make games. You got to think of ways to present this in a way that's non-threatening and isn't anything to do with Buddhism. You know, that's the thing. Oh my gosh, you're weird. Your parents gave you something about Buddhism. This isn't about Buddhism, it's about your brain. <laughs> your brain is in there. Let me out, let me out, let me out. <laughs> it's trying to get out and trying to say, you know, I'm so powerful. I can really help you with your grades and all kinds of things if you just let me out and don't suffocate me from the future or the past. Just be with me as I go through the day. It's like a game paint the pictures do you ever paint does she ever do any painting yeah does she yeah both both my daughters are really artistic and i think it's a very um actually hugh is as well it's a very uh good um well, I don't know how to describe it. It's not, it's not just a skill, is it? But it, there's a very interesting mental aspect around art that I think is very linked to meditation. Yeah, but it's a way to speak too. It's like if you have a voice and you sing, it's your way to speak. If you play the, you know, uh, the um, cello, it's your way of speaking. You can't take it away. So if a person wants art and they get into art, it's their expression. It's in a form of expression. And so when we use it to help people to, you know, what are the colors going to be? And I've had done retreats with artists and they go home and then their art changes. The colors they choose changes or the shapes of it is not, no more cubism, but roundness and flowing and moving and sky blue and sea colors and sea greens and things like this, instead of really harsh colors of yellow and rust and dark browns and blacks, you see? Changing, changing. So that's one way of talking to her about where is the present time. I wish that I thought of talking about that more with uh, lockdowns, but you know, the kids are more resilient than we thought they were, but at the same time, there's a lot of trouble for the, for the uh, preteens that we're getting ready to go into, you know, into high school and stuff. They're really tough times. But there's always ways out of paint. If you had a present time ride, what would you want that ride to look like? A unicorn? <laughs> a flying horse or uh you know a uh, a ferrari <laughs> yeah so anybody else have any questions yeah okay i can't believe we're almost we got it we did it at eight o'clock it's amazing i don't know what happened to us this is like eight o'clock, is that right? <laughs> I think so, yeah. So, um, okay, so next week, what we will do is we will stick with this and you need to send me a note. Let me know if you liked this. Let me know if I'm feeding you the right food. I have a rough time with my puppy. <laughs> I give them the right food, everything's okay, and it's easy to clean up. And, and when somebody comes and wants to give him food, like street food, and then it's a mess, <laughs> and, and it takes a lot of work. Uh, this puppy, I, I don't know, I think this puppy is a blessing because it makes me get up and move in the morning and, and wash, you know, and scrub. And then uh, he shows up with the, the, the baby, we call it the baby, and it's a it's a towel with a knot in the middle of it. He drags it over, drops it on my foot if I sit down. I want to play. And it means fetch, 
10 or 20 times. So I have to throw it and throw it in. And, and then when he comes back, he drops it on my foot and I tell him, sit down. And I give him a little piece of dog food. And then I say, okay, now I point to the floor. Now I don't even have to touch the floor. I point to the floor and he lies down and he looks up at me and I give him another treat. He's great. Did you, did you hear the story of this puppy? Turned out to be a he, not a she. And I'm there, wait a second, I, wait a second, I was on a farm for years. What happened with that? How did I miss that? And one of the kids said is, that's not a girl, that's a boy. <laughs> and I said, I'll be darn, you're right. Yeah. So it was a very funny experience. I think they named the puppy Tuffy. So now the name, the, boy, the, the dog has a name, Tuffy. But Tuffy has his own world. <laughs> And he's actually, he'll come and sing beside you when you're having uh, your breakfast and want part of it, that sort of thing. So we talk a lot. <laughs> so I want you all to have a really good week. I want you all to smile a lot. Please uh, be on time for the meeting uh, for the next couple of weeks so we can get through this pamphlet. If you like this, there, we can do a little more of it if nobody else is doing this kind of thing. There are a couple of books that are, I do have here that can help us to go further with questions about Buddhism. And if you have any questions about Buddhism, not just the practice, any questions about Buddhism, now is the time to throw them at me, you know, uh, and have me pick them up on WhatsApp and address them in the class, okay? Uh, because open time, really, really open, okay? Sounds good. Okay. Um, I want this, right, okay. So we say a closing prayer now, okay? May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So I will see you next week. Um, and also, Sarah, when is the uh, when is the yoga taking place on Saturday? Is that right? Saturday at um, your usual time. Sunday? Yeah. It's two, I know it's two o'clock here in the UK, but it's whenever you normally do your session. What day is it? Saturday. On Saturday. Okay. Yeah. So the Saturday session where we were sitting for one hour and then we were doing questions and answers and some teaching. Okay. Uh, this week, doing it twice or once? one week right we're doing it once okay yeah this yeah. weekend on saturday they're going to have the yoga that is done with twim okay and so they're going to do that session on saturday and that would be um saturday session um and what time dama gavesi 6 30. 6 30 right at 6.30 on Saturday. So instead of the sitting session, we're going to do the yoga class. So this is gonna be fun. I hope everybody will come and join in on this. And um, I'll see you then. Okay, happy day. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Bye-bye.